Hey Optimats, it's Chris here. So I've had some conversations recently that make me think that I should really talk more about Warlocks because Warlocks are a lot different than any other spellcaster in the game and spells are kind of my specialty and Warlocks, because they're so different, require some special attention because they use spells a lot differently than other casters do. They also have some unique abilities that other casters don't have. Uh, and I actually really want to talk today about one of those special abilities, which are the invocations, which have similarity to spell casting and are going to be a really important part of how you build your warlock character. Now, due to this sheer quantity of invocations in the game, I'm going to need to split this video into two parts. So today I'm going to be covering all the invocations that you can take when you first get invocations at level 2, or the invocations that you require a pact to get so you can get them at level 3. All the invocations that require level 5 or higher in order to access, I will be going over in next week's video. Uh, but before we do that, I have a Patreon and I want to thank some of my Archmage level subscribers on that Patreon. Today I want to thank Ben Potts, Kurt G, Lyric, Matt, Matt Couch, Maximilian Snyder, Mike Gapik, and Nick Lutz. Thank you all so much for your support. And if you are interested in checking out my Patreon, you'll find a link in the video description. These Archmage level subscribers join me once a month for a one-shot of D&D. So let's get started talking about invocations. So when you are playing a Warlock character, you're not going to know a lot of invocations. You don't know any at first level, you're going to get two at second level, and even by 20th level, you'll only have eight. Through most levels of play, if you are playing a straight Warlock, you can expect to have between two and five invocations, depending on your level. Invocations are a very important part of how you build an effective Warlock character. And they are one of the prime reasons why, if you are multi-classing Warlock, you usually want at least two levels of Warlock as a dip. Now, invocations in general do a number of different things. I've narrowed it down to nine kinds of invocations that you can expect to find. The first kind take the Eldritch Blast cantrip and they improve it in some way. The second kind improves the Hex spell and or Hexblade's curse. The third kind grants a passive ability that's always on. The fourth kind grants some skill proficiencies. The fifth kind improves your Pact ability, whether it's Blade Pact, Chain Pact, or Tome Pact. The sixth ability grants an ability that is kind of spell-like, though not an actual spell. The seventh kind grants a spell you can cast once per long rest using one of your Warlock Pact slots, so it's just like another spell known, except you can only cast it once. The eighth kind grants a spell you can cast once per long rest without using a Pact slot. And the ninth kind allows you to cast a spell at will, occasionally with some kinds of parameters. Now of all of these, the ones I find most limiting are the ones that allow you to grant a spell that you can cast once per long rest using a packed slot. Because one thing about Warlocks is you are going to have a lot of spells known compared to how many spells you can actually cast. Because the Warlock pack slots don't increase very quickly. And although you recover them on a short rest, you will often run out of your pack slots quite quickly. Now just a pet peeve of mine is just the way that they are arranged when you look at your player's handbook or your Xanathar's guide. What you're going to find in those books is the invocations are listed alphabetically. But a lot of invocations have level requirements. So if you have reached 5th level and you're looking for the new invocations that are available at 5th level, there's a lot of going back and forth trying to find those invocations. So the first thing I've done is as we're going to go through these invocations, we're going to start with the ones that are available right at second level, then we're going to look at the ones available at fifth level, and so on. As usual, as I evaluate these invocations, I will be color coding them for the effectiveness I think they have. I will be putting them as red if it's an invocation I would never take. I'll put them as orange if I think it's an invocation that could occasionally be useful, but it's probably too circumstantial. 
I'll rate it as purple if I think it is a decent invocation. I will rank it as green if I think it's a good invocation. And I'll rank it as blue if I think it is a must-have invocation. Now, if you are colorblind, I will be using stars with each ranking as well. One star for red, two stars for orange, three stars for purple, four stars for green, and five stars for blue. So let's do the very best invocation first. And the best invocation, I think, and pretty much a must-have for almost any warlock you make, is Agonizing Blast. In order to get Agonizing Blast, you must have the Eldritch Blast cantrip. And what it does is when you cast an Eldritch Blast, you're going to add your Charisma modifier to the damage it deals on a hit. Now the reason why this is a lot better than adding uh, ability modifiers to other attack cantrips is because once you reach level 5, you'll be casting your Eldritch Blast and you'll be doing more than one blast. So you will be adding your Charisma bonus to each blast. Eventually, when you get to 17th level, that will be four blasts, so you'll be adding your Charisma modifier four times to the damage. Agonizing Blast is an absolute must-to-have if you intend to be doing damage as part of what you want to do as a Warlock. Now, you can make Warlocks, and I have even presented a build on this channel, that don't focus on Eldritch Blast, or maybe even don't have Eldritch Blast, especially if they are focusing on weapon use. But I would say that the vast majority of Warlocks are going to be using Eldritch Blast probably a lot. And therefore, Agonizing Blast is an absolute must-have. And it's usually my first pick at level 2. So when it comes to the ranking, very easy blue ranking. The second invocation is Armor of Shadows. Now what Armor of Shadows does is it allows you to cast Mage Armor on yourself at will without expending spell slots or material components. Now the problem with Armor of Shadows is that I think that most Warlocks aren't going to get a lot of use out of it. Warlocks are already proficient in Light Armor, and if you are Hexblade, you're already proficient in Medium Armor, so Armor of Shadows and Mage Armor are probably not going to provide you a lot in the way of Armor class. Even a non-Hexblade Warlock, if they ever get even Studded Leather plus one, they already have an Armor class as high as Mage Armor is ever going to give them. So why do I say it's circumstantial? Well, because there are builds that can make use of Mage Armor when you are multi-classing Warlock. For example, let's say you are playing a Moon Druid, uh, and then you take some Warlock, Mage Armor could be very useful, because when you go into your Wild Shape form, you're not wearing armor. And if the natural armor is less than three, then Mage Armor is going to increase your armor class. And when you are Wild Shaped, your armor class isn't usually that good, and a plus three can make a big difference. There are also some other specialized builds where this could be useful, mainly in cases where we're looking at builds that for some reason would not be wearing armor. But for most Warlocks, I would say that Armor Shadows is going to give you little or potentially no benefit at all. The next invocation is called Aspect of the Moon. This one requires that you have Pact of the Tome. What this does for you is you no longer need to sleep, and you can't be forced to sleep. So this is going to give you immunity to certain things like the sleep spell, or even uh, the sleep version of the evil eye spell. It also allows you, when you take a long rest, to do light activity during that long rest. So you can do things like be on watch for the entire night. So these benefits, again, I would say are very circumstantial. Sleep spells can be a big problem if you get hit with them, but not for many levels. Evil Eye can be a big problem if you get hit with it, but how many creatures are going to be casting Evil Eye? Not very many. These things just aren't going to come up very often. And sure, being able to be on guard all night is somewhat useful, but we tend to adventure in parties. We can usually split up those guarding duties. So again, in most cases, this isn't a huge benefit. So these are small benefits or incredibly circumstantial benefits, so I have to rate this one orange overall. The next invocation is Bee Speech. This allows us to speak with animals at will without expending a spell slot. Speak with animals as it is is an incredibly circumstantial spell, and this is the problem with being able to cast an incredibly circumstantial spell over and over again is if those circumstances to use it don't come up, being able to cast it at will isn't such a big deal. Not to say that Speak with Animals will never be useful for you. Sometimes it is. But I wouldn't expect it to come up very much. There are certain adventures where it might not come up at all. 
And when it comes to warlocks, we really don't want to waste our invocations. And I just don't think Beast Speech is going to come up enough in most campaigns to be worthwhile. The campaigns where I would consider it are ones where we know that there's always going to be beasts around. We can get maybe useful information from them. Uh, and in those cases, I could potentially see taking it. But for my average warlock, it's not even an invocation I'm going to consider. The next invocation is Beguiling Influence. This gives us proficiency in deception and persuasion. Now, I wish that this would give you expertise if you already had these skills, uh, because there's a decent chance you're going to have deception and or persuasion because you are a charisma-based caster, so those are kind of the skills that you probably want to be proficient in anyway. But it doesn't do that. It only adds these skills if you are not proficient to begin with. However, if you are wanting to play a skills-based character, this is two additional skills, and two additional skills is significant. And being a charisma-based character, deception and persuasion are skills that you probably want to be proficient in. So if that is the goal of my character, I could see the use of Beguiling Influence. So overall, I'm going to rate it purple, because I think it's okay. Uh, again, probably not one of my first selections for most warlocks I'm going to make but I can definitely see builds where I would want to use it. The next invocation is Book of Ancient Secrets. This is only for Pact of the Tome, and this one is a really good invocation. If I'm playing a Pact of the Tome Warlock, Book of Ancient Secrets is almost always an invocation I'm going to want on my list. The closest comparison I can make to Book of Ancient Secrets is it is similar to getting the Ritual Caster feat as a class feature. But it is better than the Ritual Caster feat, because the Ritual Caster feat allows you to select one class and you can learn and cast the ritual spells from that class. Book of Ancient Secrets allows you to cast ritual spells from any class. Soon as you take this feature, you're going to be able to select two first level rituals from any class. This, of course, is going to get you things like Find Familiar, which you are definitely going to want. But the real feature here is as you discover ritual spells in spell books and the like, as you adventure, you will be able to add them to your Book of Ancient Secrets, allowing you to cast those spells as rituals. The limit here, as you would expect, is that there is going to be a limit to the level of ritual you can cast based on half your warlock level. So this is a blue ranking for me. The next invocation I want to talk about is Devil's Sight. This one allows you to see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical, to a distance of 120 feet. So this is just way better than dark vision for a few reasons. The first thing is we have a range of 120 feet. So there are a select few number of races that get dark vision to 120 feet. The second thing is it allows us to see normally in darkness. This means that we don't suffer the dim light disadvantage that somebody with dark vision would normally have doing perception checks in darkness. We're able to see in darkness using devil's sight the same as if we were in bright light. And the final thing is it allows us to see in magical darkness. So we can combine this with things like the darkness spell so that we can see normally and other creatures, even if they have dark vision, can't see. This can give us advantage on attacks and disadvantage to being attacked. Now the one strange thing about Devil's Sight is because of the way that it's worded, if you are in dim light, Devil's Sight does not provide you any advantage. So you still suffer the normal disadvantage to perceive that you would have in dim light unless you already have dark vision. But Devil's Sight is a very good invocation, and something I'm going to consider on a lot of Warlock builds I make, I would rank it as green. The next invocation I'm going to talk about is Eldritch Sight. This allows us to cast Detect Magic at will without expending a spell slot. Now, Detect Magic is a ritual, so a lot of characters may be able to cast Detect Magic as a ritual without expending a spell slot. The advantage of Eldritch Sight is that we don't have to cast it as a ritual. So instead of taking 10 minutes, it takes one action. This means that Eldritch Sight is something that you might have up regularly. It also can save you time when we're looking for magic items, and maybe we don't have that 10 minutes to cast a ritual. There is a certain convenience factor to being able to cast it as an action. 
there may even be some circumstantial in combat uses when we're trying to detect magic that maybe enemy spellcasters are using. In general, I think this is a decent cantrip. I don't think it's great. Like I said, a lot of casters that are already going to be able to cast detect magic. Maybe even we are able to cast detect magic if we're packed to the tome and we've booked of ancient secrets without expending spell slots. It's really just reducing the casting time. And although it reduces that casting time a lot, I think overall this is okay and I would give it a purple ranking. The next invocation I'm going to talk about is Eldritch Spear. Now, Eldritch Spear requires you have the Eldritch Blast cantrip, and what it does is it increases the range of your Eldritch Blast to 300 feet. Now, this is a huge increase in range. The range of Eldritch Blast is normally 120 feet, so we're talking more than double the range. So that sounds amazing. And the limiting factor, though, is that 120 foot range is usually plenty. It is going to be fairly rare when you need to be using Eldritch Blast and you can't get in that 120 foot range. And although this becomes a very useful invocation in those cases, in the average adventure I wouldn't necessarily expect it to come up. So I need to rank it as orange even though it is a huge increase in range. The next invocation is Eyes of the Runekeeper. This allows you to read all writing so you can read writing of different languages and the like. It's a little bit like having Comprehend Languages up all the time, except it is only for the written word. This kind of makes it more circumstantial than Comprehend Languages, which is already somewhat cir circumstantial, and I think it makes it overly circumstantial. And that's why I'm giving this an orange ranking. The next invocation I want to talk about is Fiendish Vigor. What this does is it allows you to cast the False Life spell on yourself at will as a first level spell, without expending a spell slot or material components. And what False Life does is it gives you temporary hit points equal to 1d4 plus 4 for a one hour duration, no concentration. What this means is with Fiendish Vigor you can essentially grant yourself 8 temporary hit points whenever you have time to recast a spell. This could potentially even be useful in mid-combat if d4 plus 4 hit points is going to make a big difference. Now at low levels for a Warlock, 8 temporary hit points could be a very significant amount. But as we move up in levels, we're going to find more and more ways to get temporary hit points, including through our Warlock spells, such as Armor of Agathis. Furthermore, as a percentage of our total hit points, it's going to become less and less and less, because it's never going to scale with our level. So I could totally see taking this on a second level Warlock. I could not see holding this beyond, say, 5th level. So overall, I would grant it a purple ranking. It's an invocation I would consider for a low-level Warlock, but as we get into mid-levels, I'm not considering Fiendish Vigor anymore. And if I already have it, I'm going to be switching it out. The next invocation I want to talk about is Gaze of Two Minds. This allows us to use our action to touch a willing humanoid, and now we can perceive through its senses until the end of our next turn. We can increase the duration by expending our action every turn, which means we really can't do anything else. Uh, and while perceiving through the other creature's senses, we also benefit from any special senses that they have. So what this could do is, for example, let's say you have a player character that is going to be doing the scouting. We could use Gaze of Two Minds in order to see through that scout senses. So if, for example, they got into trouble, we would know and be able to let the rest of the party know. This also could be used as a method to spy. We could use it to maybe use Gaze of Two Mind on a creature that is going to be having access to an area where normally we wouldn't be able to. And we could perceive through its senses technically indefinitely. So there's some uses here for infiltration. There's some uses here for information. Overall, I don't think this is an overly powerful invocation, but I do think there are enough uses of it that I would think it's at least decent. I would give it a purple ranking. The next invocation is Gift of the Ever-Living Ones. This is a chain-packed invocation only. Whenever you regain hit points while well, your familiar is within 100 feet of you, you treat any dice rolled to determine the hit points you regain as having rolled their maximum value for you. Now the first thing we need to remember is that a lot of healing that we might receive in Dungeons & Dragons isn't going to involve dice rolls. If the Paladin lays on hands, if we eat a good berry, 
even if we receive something like a healing word, the amount of that healing word that is based on a die roll, it might be actually less than half of the total healing. But on the other hand, there are some ways that this provides significant value. First off, a character with Gift of the Ever-Living Ones is a character I would definitely consider scaling Cure Wounds for. A Cure Wounds spell cast on somebody with Gift of the Ever-Living Ones is going to scale 8 hit points per level of cast. It's also a reason why we might want to figure out a way to get Cure Wounds on our own spell list, because our pack slots are going to scale with level. So if we use a pack slot to cast a Cure Wounds on ourselves when we're ninth level, that's 40 hit points of healing before we even add our ability score. But I think maybe the biggest advantage of Gift of Ever Living Ones is how it affects short rests. Because with short rests, we're going to be expending hit dice in order to heal ourselves. And there is luck involved. With Gift of the Ever Living Ones, it ensures that when you take a short rest, you're always receiving the maximum amount from every hit die you spend. That means you could potentially take more short rests and heal more. And of course, as a warlock, we want to be taking lots of short rests anyways. So Gift of Ever Living Ones really builds on what you want to be doing with a warlock in the first place. And I think it overall is a pretty good invocation. So I give it a green ranking. The next invocation I want to talk about is Grasp of Hadar. This requires we have the Eldritch Blast cantrip, and what it does is, once on each of our turns, when we hit a creature with the Eldritch Blast, we can move that creature in a straight line 10 feet closer to you. Now there's another invocation we'll be talking about soon that pushes a creature 10 feet away from you. So this is kind of the reverse of that, except the disadvantage of this one is it can only be used once per turn. And this isn't a problem when we're below fifth level, but once we're fifth level or higher, we could be potentially hitting more than one creature in a turn, and therefore we're not getting as much movement from Grasp of Fadar as we are from the other invocation. However, sometimes pulling rather than pushing is exactly what we want to do. We have a cleric, has a spirit guardians up, we might want Grasp of Fadar in order to pull creatures into that effect so that they take damage immediately. Same thing maybe if we have a druid with Moonbeam. And there are other reasons why we might want to pull a creature instead of pushing them. So this is something I might consider if I really want to focus on my Eldritch Blast. If I want to focus on my Eldritch Blast, first off I'm going to take Agonizing Blast. Then I'm going to be looking for ways to improve it. And a lot of the ways we can improve it is with the ability to move people around the battlefield. And pushing them is great, but not always what we want to do. Sometimes we want to pull. And Grasp of Vidar gives us another option. So again, if Eldritch Blast is really what I want to focus on. Grasp of Vidar is probably a good choice in that case, though it wouldn't be the first invocation I would take. And overall, I think it's okay, and I would give it a purple ranking. The next invocation I want to talk about is Improved Packed Weapon. This requires Pact of the Blade, and it affects our Pact Weapon, making it better. The first thing it does is it allows us to use our Pact Weapon as a spell casting focus. This could be very important if we are using a weapon and a shield because we won't be able to use spells with the material component without putting that weapon away, which is something we probably don't want to have to deal with. Now keep in mind that if a spell has a somatic component but no material component, you're still going to need the Warcaster feat to be able to cast it if your hands are full. The second thing it does is it grants the weapon a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls. This only applies if it already doesn't have a bonus. But the nice thing about this is it is useful with certain magic weapons. If a magic weapon doesn't provide a bonus to attack and or damage, we can still use improved packed weapon with it once we make that magic weapon into our packed weapon in order to get those bonuses. But if we have the standard plus one weapon, then improved packed weapon suddenly becomes a lot worse. And the final advantage of this is we can make an improved packed weapon that is a short bow, long bow, light crossbow, or heavy crossbow. So if we want to make a warlock that's going to focus on archery, meaning we're probably not focusing on Eldritch Blast, we can do that with improved packed weapon. But keep in mind that short bow, long bow, light crossbow, and heavy crossbow obviously deliberately has excluded hand crossbow. But if I am playing a Pact of the Blade and using weapons is part of what I want to do, 
Improved Pack Weapon is probably something I want to consider at level 3. Plus 1 to hit and damage is significant. Being able to use your weapon as a spellcasting focus is significant. And if I want to play an archery style warlock, this is pretty much a must if I want my packed weapon to be a ranged weapon. But once I get magic weapons going and that plus one to hit and damage isn't really coming into play anymore, I probably won't want to use an entire invocation slot for the minor benefits this is providing me. So overall, improved packed weapon I would say is a purple ranking. It is a decent invocation, but not necessarily something I'm going to keep forever. The next invocation I want to talk about is Lance of Lethargy. This requires the Eldritch Blast cantrip, and what it does is once on each of our turns, when we hit a creature with an Eldritch Blast, we can reduce that creature's speed by 10 feet until the end of our next turn. Now we've already seen invocations that will pull a creature if you hit him with an Eldritch Blast, and we're going to see an invocation that will push a creature with an Eldritch Blast. So this one will slow a creature. I would say of the three, this is the least fancy. I also think that the once per turn limitation is a pretty big limitation, especially because I think that slowing a creature by 10 feet isn't as good as pushing them by 10 feet. Now, there is the uh, thing that if a creature has the ability to move more than once on their turn, either they're dashing or they have special abilities like maybe orcs do, uh, then Lance of Lethargy might allow them to stay further away from you than you would get by pushing them by 10 feet. But nevertheless, I think that is going to come up fairly rare. Uh, most of the time, I would say that pushing a creature or pulling a creature is better. But again, if I'm really focusing on Eldritch Blast, maybe I want to be able to push those creatures and slow them. And in those cases, I could see Lance of Lethargy being relatively useful. So if I'm really wanting to focus on my Eldritch Blast, this is an invocation that I'm eventually going to consider. It's never going to be one of the first ones I take, but I could see taking it for that kind of build. And in that kind of build, I think it is a decent pick. So I am going to rank it purple. The next invocation I want to talk about is Mask of Many Faces. This allows us to cast Disguise Self at will without expending a spell slot. I think this is really good. Disguise Self is a somewhat circumstantial spell, but when you can cast it all the time, you're going to find that it is useful more often than you would think. I had a Warlock character where the other player characters never knew what my character actually looked like because they had Mask of Many Faces and were just constantly changing their appearance. This is going to allow you to infiltrate. This is going to allow you to blend into crowds. This is going to allow you to conceal your identity. A Mask of Many Faces does come up enough that I think it is a pretty good invocation and I'm going to rank it green. The next invocation I want to talk about is Misty Visions. This allows you to cast Silent Image at will without expending a spell slot or material components. Silent Image I consider a reasonably good spell, so being able to cast at will is pretty good. The thing to keep in mind though is Silent Image does use your concentration, so if you're using Misty Visions, that is going to interfere with things like using Hex, for example. But if I have Misty Visions, maybe I'm not casting Hex, maybe I'm using Silent Image, and if I'm going to take Misty Visions, I'm probably using it a lot. And in those cases, I think it can be pretty effective. And therefore, I think this is a green ranked invocation. The next invocation we're going to talk about is Repelling Blast. Repelling Blast requires the Eldritch Blast cantrip. And what it does is when we hit a creature with an Eldritch Blast, we can push the creature up to 10 feet away from us in a straight line. Now, the one way that this is better than the other invocations that use Eldritch Blast to control creatures movement or move creatures is that this one is not limited to once a turn. That means if we get to 5th level or 11th level or 17th level, we can be pushing back creatures potentially 20 feet, 30 feet, or even 40 feet. When we consider the number of creatures in the player's handbook that require getting into melee to be effective, that makes Repelling Blast really, really good. If I want to focus on Eldritch Blast, Repelling Blast is usually the next invocation I'm going to take after Agonizing Blast. And therefore, I think this is a very strong invocation, and I'm going to give it a green ranking. The next invocation I'm going to talk about is Thief of Five Fates. This allows us to cast Bane once using a Warlock spell slot. 
and once we do so, we can't do so again until we finish a long rest. So this is the first invocation I think is just a bad invocation. First off, Bane is a first level spell. We already have invocations that allow us to cast first level spells at will. Being able to cast a first level spell once using a pack slot, and I'm talking once per long rest, isn't that great. It better be a pretty good spell. And Bane is an okay spell at best. It's not a great spell. And it's definitely not something I think it's worth putting an invocation into just to add to your Warlock spell list. Another thing to remember is we don't have a lot of pack slots. Using up our pack slots is valuable. And as a Warlock, we often have actually a, quite a few known spells considering the number of spells we're actually casting. And as we get further into analyzing Warlocks, I'm going to talk about that more. But what that does mean is that just adding one more known spell, when it's not a spell that's really adding a lot to what we can do, isn't a very valuable thing. So Thief of Five Feats, I kind of figure, is just throwing your invocation away. And therefore, I'm giving it a red ranking. The next invocation I'm going to talk about is Voice of the Chainmaster. This is the last of the invocations that does not require at least 5th level in order to get. This requires that you have the Pact of the Chain feature, and what it does is it allows you to communicate telepathically with your familiar and perceive through your familiar senses as long as you're on the same plane of existence. Additionally, what you can do is, while you're looking through your creature's senses, you can also speak through your familiar in your own voice, even if your familiar can normally not speak. Now there are a number of ways that this is really good. The first off is it is an improvement to Find Familiar. Find Familiar is already a great spell, probably my favorite spell for its level in the game. Then when we take Pact of the Chain, we make Find Familiar significantly better. And then when we take Voice of the Chain Master, we're taking that improved Find Familiar and making that even better. Normally a familiar's telepathy range with you is 100 feet, which is very useful. But there are often cases where we wish we could do more than 100 feet. With Voice of the Chain Master, we have basically an indefinite range as long as we're on the same plane of existence. And remember that a lot of our familiars can turn invisible. And therefore, we have an invisible scout that we can telepathically communicate with and share senses with over any range. There's also the use in the ability to communicate with creatures at a distance. Uh, Voice of the Chain Master is going to have huge value for you if you are playing Pact of the Chain. And therefore, if I'm playing Pact of the Chain, Voice of the Chain Master is something that is near the top of my list. So I am going to give it a blue ranking. So next week, I'm going to be coming back with the rest of the invocations for Warlock. These will be all the invocations that require you being level 5 or higher to access. And after that, we're going to get into some more Warlock content. We're going to be talking about the spells. We're going to be talking about multiclassing. And yes, we're going to be talking about some builds. So I hope you'll join me then. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. And I will talk to you next week.